This video is brought to you by NordVPN. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. It may be possible that the face of warfare might be changing. No longer will it be violent, but technological. Every year, the director of the NSA releases a document titled Worldwide Threat Assessment, which outlines the biggest threats to national security. Cybersecurity was first mentioned in 2011, and back then, it was among the lower ranked threats. A mere two years later, it became the number one threat and has stayed there ever since. The idea that hackers are hooded loners who live in their parents' basement is a stereotype that has outgrown our times. Nation states already have entire departments of their national defense dedicated to fighting cybersecurity threats. But some nations don't just have defense, they also have cyber offense. Let's take a look at how some countries are using hacking on the global stage. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. In 2010, a new form of malware hit thousands of computers worldwide. The worm, called Stuxnet, was designed to target Windows computers running SCADA software. Developed by Siemens, SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. It's used to control and manage power grids. The main objective for Stuxnet was to get computers which controlled the supply of power and began systematically shutting down its PLCs, or Programmable Logic Controllers. Its end target was Iran's first nuclear enrichment facility, which was due to open that October. These facilities are extremely well protected. They're not connected to the internet in such a way where one can simply download a bug. Getting into the plant was a matter of being brought in physically. The 500 kilobyte worm was dropped in Iran and scattered itself across the companies which designed the PLCs. One such company was Berpaggio, an engineering firm geographically centered around Iran's nuclear facilities. According to US federal court documents, the company was involved in, quote, illegal procurement activities in Iran. The bug kept spreading via USBs until it found itself in the hands of the workers of the targeted uranium plant. Three separate workers unknowingly infected the plant with the worm by connecting USB drives from external infected computers into the secure facility. In January of that year, inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency noted that the centrifuges which were used to enrich uranium were failing at abnormal rates. It was a complete mystery to the operators with no apparent root causes. Five months later, a computer security company began investigating the random crashes and rebooting of computers across Iran. This would eventually lead to the discovery of the Stuxnet worm, perhaps the world's first digital weapon, at least that we know of. But before the discovery, the worm had already began working, systematically decreasing the reliability of the plant. In the space of a couple of months, 328 centrifuges went offline. The centrifuges kept shutting down, one by one, as if a sniper was taking them out. And in a way, that's exactly what was happening. By November, that number had rose to 984 units offline. This hindered the nation's nuclear efforts, yet it was unclear how far the bug could have gone or what else it had planned. It's clear that such a sophisticated program, which passed under malware searches and the heavy security systems of nuclear facilities, was not the work of a lone wolf. This was a large group with funding and intricate knowledge of security systems and nuclear processes. According to the Washington Post, Unnamed US officials have admitted that Stuxnet was a joint effort between the United States and Israel. The officials say that the program was first developed under Bush and continued under Obama. The program code, named Olympic Games, was initially never meant to be let into the wild, but as nuclear talks between the US and Iran hit a standstill, the ultra-sophisticated worm was released. Yet, it's still unknown if it was a purposeful or accidental release. Two years after Stuxnet in 2012, the world's worst hack ever seen had hit. It would be called Shamoon, and it would cripple a titan of industry and send shockwaves through the global economy. Saudi Aramco is an oil company owned by the government of Saudi Arabia. It supplies approximately 10% of the world's oil, and it's the world's most profitable company by a long shot. Their upcoming initial public offering will probably be the biggest in history. So this attack began strategically on the month of Ramadan when most employees were on holiday. It took only a few hours to infect the 35,000 computers and begin to wipe and destroy their machines. 
The wiped out data was replaced by an image of a burning American flag. Saudi Aramco stopped moving. Computer technicians at Saudi Aramco began frantically ripping out cables from the back of computers across the world. They were doing all that they could to get the computers offline and stop the virus from spreading. Now, Saudi Aramco went dead silent. While the production processes were automated, the rest of their business was frozen. The network required to carry out transactions was simply no longer there. In a matter of hours, the world's most profitable company was thrown back into the Stone Ages. They had to refuse trucks from loading as there was no system to pay. Tanker trucks were backed up for kilometers in a standstill. Saudi Aramco even began using paper and pen as if it was the 1970s again. After 17 days, the company began giving away oil to keep the Saudi economy flowing. To rectify the hack, the company hired an army of IT professionals. They sent people directly to manufacturing lines in Southeast Asia to buy as many hard drives as they could directly from production floors. Floods in Thailand had already hampered global hard drive supply, and now Saudi Aramco was buying everything that was left. This caused a ripple effect on the economy, and for several months, people had to pay a premium for hard drives due to Saudi Aramco's single-handed increase in demand. Five months after the attack, the company brought the system back online, and this time with far higher cybersecurity protection. The hackers that created the Shamoon virus, at least according to official records, have never been identified or caught. It's a strange and mysterious case. The ability to create such a sophisticated program and have no link back to the perpetrators is undoubtedly the work of an advanced funded group. However, the group's motives are not clear. It was a specifically targeted attack, but on whom? On the Saudi government or Saudi Aramco itself? Or was it even the whole oil and gas industry? And what did that burning American flag mean? It was the only message left by the hackers. Perhaps we'll never know. Jump to 2016, and the United States was in the middle of an election between Democrat Hillary Clinton and Republican Donald Trump. Both sides of the political spectrum seemed to be getting more radical. Polarization became the new buzzword used to describe the political climate. But one of the pivotal moments during her campaign's downfall came at the hands of her emails. Tens of thousands of Clinton emails were leaked through WikiLeaks, the Guccifer 2.0 persona, and DCLeaks.com. According to the CIA, the leaks of these emails came at the hands of hacking groups Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, which, according to US intelligence, have been linked to Russia's intelligence agency, the GRU. Spear phishing is a cyber attack where phishing emails target individuals rather than random people in the general population. The Fancy Bear group was able to attack more than 300 individuals who were affiliated with the Clinton campaign through spear phishing attempts. Over the next few months, the emails were released at what seemed to be strategic times during the presidential run. It prompted people to think whether the emails were released by whistleblowers. The Democratic National Committee, or DNC, which governs the Democratic Party in the United States, was also hacked. The hacker groups Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear held access to the DNC network for at least a year before beginning to leak the information from the inside. This caused the DNC's chairwoman to resign due to the leaked information. It's unclear how much of an effect this actually had on the outcome of the election. And while the US intelligence points the finger at Russia, was it really them? Or are they not telling the truth? And there have been some commentators who believe that the Russia angle is a hoax. It might be possible that we may never know the truth behind who ordered the attacks. But the point remains, the potential ability of nation states to alter electoral affairs of other nations is becoming something that the cyber age has brought to light. Previously, if nation states wanted to interfere with other nations, they would have to wage war, use an inside double agent, or have a vast, interconnected, corrupt political network already established within that nation. Today, it could be possible with just a laptop and an internet connection. And what do you see as the major cybersecurity threats? There are more than 100 countries that are developing these um, offensive cyber capabilities and using them. Um, against other countries or against in, in uh, what I would consider these small battles that could lead to bigger, bigger problems for all of us. So hacking has been around ever since computers were created. But as we move more of our infrastructure, networks and governments to the digital age, they can become exposed and vulnerable for attack. However, these are just growing pains. 
Ultimately, more funding and attention will be given to create more secure systems and stamp out malicious hacking attempts. The use of cyber means to do something malicious will probably never go away entirely, just like any crime will never entirely disappear. But counter efforts will become better and ultimately we'll all be safer for it. And who knows, much like fighting wars brought us innovations like the computer and longer range aircraft, maybe the hacking wars will advance the state of online security. But how can you keep yourself safe online? Well, NordVPN is a great solution. Whether it's stopping the big tech companies from tracking you, staying safe from hackers, or just simply bypassing Netflix's geographical restrictions, you can use NordVPN. It's as easy as downloading, installing, and using it straight away. If you want to get Nord cheaper, you can get 70% off a three-year plan at nordvpn.com slash coldfusion. And you can use the code coldfusion to get an extra month for free. Okay, so thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the podcast and follow me on Instagram and Twitter. This has been Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion and I'll catch you again soon for the next video. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's me thinking. Ah.